I may be biased, but of all the medical disciplines, I really think neurology is by far the coolest. And it's pretty cool not just because these disorders are so fundamentally intriguing, but also because the names used to describe these disorders and their symptoms are so unique and unparalleled in medicine. Welcome back to Brainwaves, I'm Jim Siegler. In today's episode of the Quanta series, we'll be talking about one of these really fascinating symptoms, agnosia. And before we get started, just to remind you, the Quanta series is kind of a podcast within a podcast. It's an offshoot of Brainwaves, where we slam you with brief but high-yield neurology content. Last time, you heard from Dr. Anjan Chatterjee about the differences between the various aphasias. And this week, we've got Dr. Jeffrey Aguirre, another cognitive neuroscientist, to teach us about agnosia, starting with what an agnosia actually is. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode was brought to you in part by Audible. With nearly 200,000 ad-free audiobooks, I'm sure you'll find something you'd like. I recommend Brain on Fire by Susanna Cahallan. It's the story of a Washington Post reporter who describes in vivid detail her battle with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. To hear this book and get your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com slash brainwaves and sign up. The first month is free and less than 15 bucks a month for each subsequent month with no cancellation fees. So take a minute to sign up for free at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. All right, now we can get back to the concept of agnosia. The word itself means uh, not knowing or loss of knowing, and it refers to this idea that you could have an intact perception of something, yet not be able to recognize or know what it is. So you can see the object, the place, the person. You appreciate all or most of the nuances of the lines and shapes and colors that comprise it, but you just don't recognize it. And the most well-known of the visual agnosias, any neurologist would agree, is prosop agnosia, the loss of recognition of faces. And imagine that. One day you're married, and the next day you don't even recognize your husband. But don't mistake this for the classic symptom, I'm really bad with faces and names. It's not the same thing. On a higher order processing level, in prosop agnosia, you absolutely cannot recognize the face. But if that person were to speak you'd recognize the person by their voice. Oh yeah, that's my husband Jack. But you can have agnosias for other sorts of stuff too, including other sorts of object and uh, thing representations. You can have agnosias for places, houses, objects. Show a patient a pair of scissors, and the patient with a particular object agnosia won't be able to tell you what it is or what they even do. But as soon as you place the scissors in their hand, they recognize it. Boom. Visual agnosia. And to make matters more complex, the reverse can also occur. Yep, there are tactile agnosias, as opposed to visual agnosias. Place the same pair of scissors in another patient's hand, blindfolded. They won't recognize what the object is, or what it does. But when you take the blindfold off, a pair of scissors. But where does all this breakdown in visual processing occur? Again, Dr. Aguirre. So in Area V1, there is a map of the visual world, sort of the Our first cortical center of visual processing, where all the images of your visual scene converge, full of raw data, like lines and shapes and colors, and it's organized. ...and what's called a retinotopic organization. But the thing is, that's not the only map of the world that's back there. There's actually map after map after map, and you can start numbering them. So there's V1, and then there's V2, and then there's V3. And V3, and V4. And then after V4, the scientists started to give the areas letters and acronyms. And so that's where we pick up our agnosia story, where the higher order visual processing pathways give rise to useful information. Broad categories, there's a dorsal pathway, the wear pathway, which is responsible for encoding object position and movement, and the ventral pathway, the what pathway, which is the neurologic epicenter of our agnosia talk. So the culmination of that processing pathway, the what pathway down through the ventral portion of the occipital lobe and into the temporal lobes, those ultimately arrive at these regions which are much less map-like anymore, but now start to have this remarkable specificity for representing different kinds of visual information, things like the appearance of faces. Like your husband Jack. Yeah, his face is down there. Appearance of houses. Your house, your friend's house, Trump's house. And objects and body parts. To all you surgeons out there, you can thank your temporal lobes for that one. 
how all that processing happens is a really interesting question that we're just beginning to get some traction on. So that's what it's like when the what pathway is fully intact. But we're not all about being fully intact here. Each of these specialized areas, if you, if you damage them, you end up with deficits in vision that seem to make sense based upon... Damage to the area responsible for faces, aka the face fusiform gyrus of the posterior temporal lobe, and you're left with an agnosia that's termed... ...is prosopagnosia, so damage to this area causes people to have trouble recognizing faces. And so there he goes, your husband Jack. Yep, he's gone now. But what's kind of interesting is that there are other parts of recognizing people that still might be okay. So these patients can often identify uh, whether someone is a man or a woman. Patients can also still figure out emotional content of faces. So a patient with prosopagnosia might not know who's looking at them, but they might know that the person's angry. Angry like, I'm your husband Jack. I can't believe you don't even recognize me. Can you imagine how awful that is? But we can't stop there with the agnosia talk. Besides classifying agnosias by the types of things you can't recognize, faces, houses, trees, planes, you can also classify agnosias by the manner in which the deficit occurs. And this may have some localizing value. Uh, and for a long time, there was this idea that there was a separation between being able to perceive the individual elements of a face and then also... An aperceptive agnosia. And then once having made a good representation of the appearance of a face, then being able to recognize what the person looks like. An associative agnosia, because you're failing to associate the features of the face or the object with something you have stored in an area of cortex. A normal percept stripped of meaning. This is this older terminology that uh, it used to be this idea that there was perception, and then uh, once you have formed a, a good percept of the face, then you have to do this match to something you know, and again, that's been kind of debated. We're not, it's not so clear anymore in the cognitive neuroscience of vision if those two things fall cleanly apart, though it still lives on a little bit. Because there happens to be some functional imaging correlates to these forms of agnosias, the aperceptive and associative types. The region we've talked about in the brain that uh, is really important for this face recognition is in the fusiform gyrus. So that is kind of back in the temporal lobe, very close to its... Um, where it meets the occipital lobe. There are other areas really far anterior into the temporal lobe that are uh, have even more specialized representations. Now, there are representations there not just of the appearance of a face, but more kind of general knowledge you might have about somebody. As in not just linking the face to the name, but also the person's voice to the face and the phone number to the person and so on. For example, there was a, a famous paper that demonstrated that you could record from these neurons in patients uh, undergoing monitoring for epilepsy surgery and find neurons that had selectivity for Jennifer Aniston, the actress. <laughs> My first paycheck! Look at the window! There's my name! Hi, me! <laughs> and these neurons would fire for not just a picture of Jennifer Aniston, but the word Jennifer Aniston on a screen or the theme song to Friends. So anything which was Jennifer Aniston-like would get these neurons to go. God, isn't this exciting? I earned this. I wiped Did she really earn this? A neuron just for her? I mean, that's kind of crazy. But that's visual agnosia for you. And that's where we'll close today. So for more info on disturbances of visual perception, stay tuned for Dr. Oguiri's full episode coming up in a few weeks. This episode of the Quanta series was produced by Jim Siegler and with the help of Erica Mejia. Music was courtesy of Ars Sonor and Nuno Adelaida. Thanks for listening. <laughs>